Let's see who's here. We got Frank the Tank, Chris's Pulembola, Laura Taylor, and 503 so far. Nice to have you all here. Looks like there's a couple other people there too. Um, let's see. I want to see if I'm picking up audio. All right. Hmm. <laughs> hey everybody, I was having some issues with audio. I'm going to try again and see if this works. So, uh, how's it coming? Can everybody hear me? I'm hoping so. I see that... Charuz is here, young lad, like I said before, but you probably didn't hear me. Uh, Chris is Columbula, Joseph Tavir, Rainy, Fish Stuff, Yotaro, Marimba Girl, 503, Jordan Abert, awesome. Luch is here too. Okay, I've been having the darndest time with audio lately, but... Um, there it is. At least we don't have to worry about it now. So, right here, as you might imagine, I have some isopods. These are Cubaris Marina Anemone. And it is time to replace their substrate. They've been in this bin far too long. So, it's been over a year and they're still doing well. I've topped off the leaf litter and things like that, added things to it. So they're doing fine, but I need to get them moved out. I sold off a number of them, and now I want to let them grow and do their thing. So I see, ah, Charlie Moorcroft is here, Theropod Hunter, Tennyson Kingsley. Great. Nancy as well. So Chris is Columbia. I think I need to get the Florida oranges because I really like these, and I, I think I would like those as well. Oh, Marimba Girl. Congrats on the... The Gem Mix Babies. Oh, sorry to hear that, Tennyson, but I'm glad you're doing you're doing better. That's that's a good thing. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can change how this is working so I can get a better look at two. So maybe I should see if someone wants to trade some anemone or glacier or papaya for Lord oranges because I'd be up for that. That's a species I can ship. And here we go. Let's see. So rainy. I've been looking at Trichelopus caucasius. I have never seen them in real life. I think I've seen images of them. They're substrates. You can see it's pretty uh, compost like. It's not all frass, which is nice, because when it is all frass, then you know you've gone far too long. And as you can see, I'm doing about halvesies on the substrate here. Uh, so half original substrate and half um, new, fresh, bio-lives, bioactive substrate. That's the, the base here, and then um, I've added some wood also from bio-lives. This is a nice, soft wood that they will love. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by putting some leaf litter, move a couple things around here so I can access these a little better, and we will chat while I move things. I'm going to put a bunch of, I'm going to try to get all the leaf litter that's in there in various stages of decay. Some of it's pretty fresh, some of it's, you know, decaying in the way they like to eat it, but uh, I don't want to waste any of it. Because what hasn't decayed will, unless they eat it first, which is also possible, it's just not as nutritious. You can see loads of springtails right there. Check it out. Someone mentioned the springtails earlier. I can't remember who it was, but somebody did. Um, oh, I love it, Jelly Bean. Wednesdays with Thrust are the best. I'm glad you enjoy them. I really do, too. 
Look how they love to hide in these these acorn hides. BioLive sent me these two. How many are in there? Like seven? <laughs> that's cool. Um, they only like one of them. And they don't like the other one, but that's okay. Maybe it's just how they're feeling at the moment. Whatever. I'm not worried about it, but uh, I'm going to put this piece over here. It has, look, at there's one that's almost almost solid wild type. It looks like it has a hint of orange on it. I just love the variety in these. They're like the Cubaris form of lavas. There's a bunch of them plus some bunch of springtails. I love to see that that many springtails in a colony. I feel like if the you have that many springtails, the substrate's not entirely exhausted yet. You still got some life in that substrate, so that makes me feel good. All right, let's see comments. I'm gonna catch up. So Tennyson is asking how the mealworms are doing. Any adults or babies even yet? Um, I definitely have adults. Uh, there are at least three adults in there. Uh, last time I checked, and it's been a little while, so uh, there are probably more. And I saw some, at least the pupae are huge. So there was a huge pupae in there, which looked awesome. Um, just for everybody's information, Tennyson is asking, we completed a trade, and I got some uh, Wisman mealworms, which are a selectively bred uh, type of mealworm that gets quite a bit larger than um, the normal mealworms. It's not like a hormonal thing or whatever, you know, artificially induced. It is bona fide uh, selective breeding with some husbandry um, improvements as well, from what I understand. But a lot of it has to do with selective breeding. But good husbandry helps keep mealworms nice and plump and big too. So thank you again for those. Looking forward to getting a nice colony going. If I can get them going really solidly, I may just start focusing on the Wisman mealworms and not keep the normal ones. And not really any reason to keep the normal ones if I have the Wisman is kind of the way I'm thinking about it. So I may do that. We'll see. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I'm I'm not catching all of the chat because of everything I'm looking at. So if, if I'm missing something, folks, uh, feel free to repeat it. Okay. Because I'm not being able to catch up. So is your experience, how long does it take Peace Gaber to mature from hatching? It depends widely on uh, resources and things like that to a large extent. I mean, it can just be a few months if they're really, you know, everything's going well, optimal conditions. And it can take a lot longer if conditions are subpar. I know that's that's a vague answer, but it's it's probably the best one I can give you. I wish I could give you a better one. Let's see. So Chris's Kalimba, you know why Cubar species rubber ducky isn't on the USDA permit? Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on there. Okay, um, my understanding is how it's working right now, and this may change, may already have changed as far as I know. But uh, the idea was that uh, as of the interview with Carlos from USDA by Wally Kern of Supreme Gecko on the Supreme Gecko channel, definitely a good interview live stream to check out. It's available on the, the site. The way Carlos explained it, um, Cubaris... Uh, species rubber ducky, they haven't been described, but because they haven't been described, there's no taxonomist, isopodologist, taxonomist who has officially described them yet. And because that is the case, um, there has been an assumption made um, that they are Cubaris marina for the, for the purposes of permits, Cubaris marina, which is permitted. You can get a permit for Cubaris marina, like these little guys here. And even though everybody's pretty aware, I mean, I don't think anybody actually thinks that rubber ducky, Cubaris species rubber ducky is Cubaris marina, but for the purposes of the permit, that is how it is listed. And so it enables people to ship Cubaris species rubber ducky across state lines if they have a permit for Cubaris marina for the state to which they are shipping. That is how it has been uh, explained to me. That was Carlos who said it, so straight from you know, the USDA representative. I don't know if it has changed since then. It's been a while since that interview. 
I don't know if it may still be the case, but it may be in flux. They may change that in the future. But that is the last I heard. And so if you have a permit for Q-Bars Marina, as far as USDA is concerned, you can legally ship rubber duckies for the time being. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I see that BioLives, Laura from BioLives is here. I, this substrate right here, you may recognize, have some of your substrate, some of your acorns in here. Um, I'm doing a half substrate switch out for these uh, Cubaris uh, Marina Anemone with your wonderful substrate. So thank you again for creating such a wonderful substrate. I've been uh, contacting Laura every month or two to get new batches of this stuff because I love it. It's great stuff. So if you haven't tried out the BioLives, BioLives with a Y in lives, BioLives, Bioactives, you can look it up online. It's on Facebook, it's on a website. Look it up, get some of this substrate because good stuff. And I did originally get a, a sample to try out, but I have been purchasing it since then because I love this stuff and I'm trying to be supportive. And I try to tell everybody about it. When people ask me about substrate, I say, oh, have you tried BioLives? And I want to get people, I want to get other people to try it and see what they think. I, th I feel like many people who have tried it have excellent uh, results with it. So, um, Oh, Meredith, same thing with Panda Kings. They, they've been included on that list. In fact, I think the way it's working, and, you know, Use this information at your own risk, but the way I understand it, anything that's a Cubaris species that is not described counts as Cubaris marina for the time being. And so panda kings count, and you know anything that's not, not been uh, identified. Okay. So rainy, I would I would go with panda kings or um, Cubaris marina, one of the you know colorful varieties. They're some of the easier ones to keep and the fact that you're not a beginner complete beginner with isopods or you know whoever you're talking about um, is not a complete beginner with isopods then I would say they're they're excellent because you're going to uh, you're gonna know enough to succeed with them and kind of hit the ground running those two are excellent for that Th that's what I would uh, that's what I would go with I'm trying to remember what my first Cubaris was. I think it might have been, uh, if it wasn't rubber duckies, it was red tigers, I think. But in red tigers, I don't think are actually Cubaris anymore. I think they've been reassigned. Um, all right. So Aqua Garden Zen, welcome. I think there are just so many species undefined or undescribed because they haven't been uh, they, we haven't had time. I mean, we don't have, there aren't very many isopodologists there now. There's Nathan, and he's awesome. He's been helping us to figure things out, which is great. But it takes time. It takes resources. And we hadn't, we were out of isopodologists for a while, and now we have one, but just one isopodologist, and it takes a long time to do all that. And we're constantly discovering new species. And so we went through a, a big period of discovery when there was just a boom in isopod variety in the hobby and we haven't caught up partly because there's there are small numbers of isopodologists yeah I, I see people who uh, are saying things like yeah if it's not if you don't know what it is put it in cubaris which is basically what they've done with a lot of them if it looks vaguely like cubaris you don't know what it is put it in there which makes it easy to get it shipped across state lines which is probably not the greatest thing ever but that's kind of how it's been working and okay I think we've got these guys pretty much rehoused yeah they're looking good there's plenty of springtails in there that's not going to be an issue I'm gonna pop the lid back on here as soon as I figure out where I put it oh, there it is okay and we'll, we'll work with something else this next one, I think that's pretty thoroughly empty there. Um, these Ukraine Pied are really, really due for, 
for a rehouse. Um, I've got lots of nice Ukraine pied in here. They're looking amazing, but they don't. Uh, uh, I need to get you where they are. I'm going to see if I can tap a few out onto here. See if they'll go out. Nah, they, eh, some of them did. We got them on here. Okay, so can I put that in there safely? I think I can. Okay, so I'm going to be taking this apart basically and removing some of the substrate and then just putting, uh, putting them back in. So they've been finishing off their calcium. I just replaced it. Uh, the other day because this one's almost gone. I've been nibbling it down in their little dish there. Okay, and I'm moving all the leaf litter over to this side. I'm going to be scooping uh, some substrate out so I can put some more in. Looks like some pyrellus moths got in there. Okay. So I've never kept the large marine isopods, of course. That's pretty rare, although it sounds cool, Rainy, that some people are doing it. I've kept the small marine isopods, several different types, but... There's Aunt Sandy! Hey, Aunt Sandy Skinks is here. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna put some fresh substrate in. There we go. Might as well put that. So this is the stuff I put in here. Biolized bioactive supplies. Complete bioactive substrate. Here's the ingredients. Rotting hardwood, compost, sphagnum moss, worm castings, bat guano, charcoal, flake soil, oak leaves, calcium carbonate, ground oyster shell, and perlite. So, pretty awesome. They've also been autoclaved, which is uh, great for making sure you're not getting any um, pests coming along with them, and is fine for setting up a new culture if you have some substrate from the old culture like I do in here, and if you don't, you can use the bioactive starter, which contains some beneficial bacteria and fungi, and you add one packet per 12 quarts of moist substrate, and it's a great way to get started. I've been using it. it seems like great stuff from what I can tell as well, so I've been enjoying it. All right, let's see. So this is what I do um, when I'm sanitizing substrate. Uh, I just put it in the oven at like 200 degrees for a little while, um, for about half an hour. Uh, that's what I do with compost. There are pros and cons to doing that, but that's what I do seems to work for me if you're using just compost which is a substrate I've used many times with success so that is that is one way to do it I have not had any ill effects from that and I don't I've never had centipedes or things like that take over my bins either so okay so I'm gonna spread out the leaves a little bit put the uh, pieces of bark back in, put the tray back in, and I'm going to give them a little bit of food. Right now I'm going to offer them some fish food pellets. They do like those. Full of protein, they have some calcium in them and other nutrients. So I got them set up. They look like they might need a little water. Put some water in there as well in their moss and maybe refresh their moss just a bit. It looks like it could use a little bit more fresh moss. So so I think there are various inoculants you can use. Um, this one happens to be a mix of several different types both bacterial and fungal. But I think you could use other things too. Let's see, where's the lid? Okay, so you know something I forgot to do, which I'm not going to forget to do anymore. I'm going to remember right now. I just 
did. I'm going to make a label. Uh, I, I'm going to put half substrate changed. And what is today? It's 3, 27, 24. And I'm going to print it. I'm going to print two copies of this. And there we go. That helps me keep track of how recently I've changed the substrate, uh, which I would totally lose track of if I didn't do this. So I try to do that almost all the time. Once in a while I've forgotten, but in general I remember and it works really well. Make me do it. Oh, Yotaro has the same, same label maker. Awesome. Okay, so what ice pods are over there. All right, so label is on. I'll be right back. So question for y'all. Uh, we can either take a peek at my um, beetle, aquatic beetle tank, or we can continue work with isopods. So tell me what you think. Where's everybody at? I just put the isopods somewhere. There they are. Okay. Just wondering where my anemones went. But I found them. Okay. Sorry for the um, for the break here. I'm switching out. Here we go. Yeah. Ooh, Darlene Morris, congratulations. Ooh, we got a super chat from Tarantula Correcti Collective. Seems like <laughs> bad branding. Uh, agreed. Agreed. That had never occurred to me before, Richard, but uh, thank you for enlightening me. I now, I can't unsee that anymore. <laughs> I, t I totally see. Totally see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me move these for a minute because now I need to go through and collect some Silisticus while we're chatting here. I'm going to collect some Silisticus. Yeah, really appreciate the super chat, Richard, as always. That is fantastic. Notice that Tarantula Collective also has an ice pod next to his name because he is a member, channel member, which is fantastic as well. Okay, so Sam asking about long-term health impacts on ice pods from mosquito bits. Um, I have not continued a whole lot of experimentation with those, but I know someone who has Ashley Nebel has uh, worked with them long term and has found that well a few isopods uh, can succumb at the beginning if they if they get the stuff sprayed directly on them uh, that in general it worked really well for her colonies and she does not have fungus nets anymore and the isopods doing great that's the last I heard so that is one testimonial for the uh, efficacy of the mosquito bits uh, without any issues for them. So a pine, is that how you say it? I'm not sure how you say it, but um, an isopod tour. I need to do one. The problem is if I did an isopod tour, it would take forever. I'm trying to figure out how to fit that in a video that would work. I have thought about doing a genus tour, like doing an armadillidium tour, and then a porcelio tour, and then a you know, oddball tour, I don't know, something. Maybe doing that. Um, I've been wondering about it, trying to figure out how to do it. It would take an incredibly long time to film, though, so I haven't 
haven't carved out the time, but if I can carve out the time to do that, I think it would be fun. It would just take a really long time. And here's another little Cubaris, not Cubaris, Silisticus. Okay. Okay, so some people are digging the, the tour idea. That's good. I mean, it's always good to know. Um, I feel like the last couple of times I've done pet, like, done tours, the, when people watch it, it hasn't been like, not a lot of people have watched it. Two people who watched it liked it. Not a lot of people watched it. I did one for 15, was it 15? 15,000 subscribers. I did one for, um, I don't remember. I did a couple for milestones. I'm about to hit 70,000, so maybe that would be a logical time to do it. What do you think? Okay. So these are our Silisticus convexus Ukraine pied. So it is a morph, and they are quite patterned and quite variable. I really love them because they're kind of unique. The way that the pattern shows up is very different from most other isopods with pattern and they they most of them are heavily patterned high contrast you get some that are low contrast like the one on the left is lower but still has lots of spots and the one on, next to it is those are all lower and this one's like high dark pattern and these are all high light pattern and there's another high dark it's one of the darkest ones i've ever seen actually and it has been way too long since the tour that's true so ukraine pied are awesome love these and one of the best things about them, they, they're they shippable in the U.S. Most, most states will accept them. So, they're also, uh, they're also very, they're good with bioactives. Most plants they will not eat. Um, and they're, they're exceptional bioactive species. So they're an all-round, all-purpose, fun isopod. The only thing is, they are a little skittish. They're not the best display as pod unless you get big numbers. Once you get large numbers, they're okay. Okay, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Because I've got this big old piece of bark covered in just raised zingers, which are one of my absolute favorites. Oh, look at that. It's the first time I've seen a colored one in here. You know, with the natural wild type. I wonder what's going on there really weird. Okay, well, I may just have gotten in there somehow, but I better get it out because as far as I know, that is a dominant trait. That individual is probably not old enough to breed yet, but uh, don't want them messing up the trait. Okay, so I'm going to put it in with the others. Um, So Therapod Hunter, 70k, and my plans to celebrate. Well, an isopod tour might not be such a bad way to do it. It might not be. I'm thinking about it. It would be fun. And actually, since uh, my wife is going to go out of town soon for a few days, and I will have uh, time on my hands to do such things, maybe. Maybe I could, uh, maybe I could film that during her trip. I don't know, that, that could be something. Because that is, uh, that'd be kind of amazing to, to do that tour, I think. I am getting to the, you know, I, I am, and I don't know how many of you have heard this, but I am slowly transitioning to try, try to just, there's, there's relatively few isopod species that can ship across state lines, right? And so I've been consolidating my isopod collection more towards those, and that doesn't mean that's exclusively what I'm going to keep in the future, but I'm trying to kind of go that direction. It just kind of makes sense, and I have to do something. I can't, uh, I can't just... I, that's probably enough explanation, but you know what I mean. 
Um, I'm not feeling it my most eloquent right now. Because I rarely do when I'm trying to uh, concentrate on seven things at once. But I think you catch my drift, hopefully. There's some nice fresh substrate. And let's get some of that leaf litter in there. This is this is my pickled my pickled leaf litter I'm putting in. I need a better tool than this. It's not these tweezers, forceps, whatever you call them. They're not long enough to get everything to reach all the way into this jar and get these pickled leaves out. <laughs> but there we go. There's a little bit more. Uh, maybe a few more. Okay, let's see. Yotaro, does anyone absolutely battle their cats while feeding their little animals? Not really. Um, we only, unfortunately, our nearly 18-year-old cat uh, passed away not long ago. He was very tolerant of critters. His last portion of his life he was also blind and so even if he hadn't been tolerant he wouldn't have been a very effective predator but uh, yeah he was not um, he was very tolerant of our rats of our bird different things he was he was really not a even though outside in the days when he used to go outside when he was younger he would attempt to pursue things he was not a he wouldn't go after our pets which was awesome our other cat that we do have that's younger, she's only about three, and she does not um, have a lot of interest in damaging things. She's very friendly, in fact, um, with supervision, of course, but we have her out when we have our leopard gecko out and our snakes and everything, and she's fine. So, Stephen Logan, will I be tending the Bugapalooza for Roach Crossing next month? We will see. We will see. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, so, we'll have to see how that goes. But I, I would, I, I can't guarantee I'll be there, but I would be fun. Sometimes I pop in for a, a little while. I usually don't buy a whole lot because um, I'm usually not in a position to, but um, I, I enjoy them. So pickled leaves are basically, this is kind of a, it's a newer experiment that I'm doing, but basically it's a way of fermenting leaves more quickly uh, using techniques similar to making sauerkraut, which I do. I make my own sauerkraut and it's very successful at doing that. And so I'm using a similar technique to pickle the leaves, causing fermentation to go faster. And thank you everyone for the the kind words and thoughts about our cat. It it was a rough day. It's been, you know, we've had rough times since too. But the good thing is, um, he didn't he was starting to get sick and we brought him to the vet and they gave him an ultrasound and didn't find any tumors or anything. And then two weeks later he was having some of the same problems. So we brought him back to the vet and they, ex uh, not x-rayed, but I guess they palpated him and found a tumor that had grown in the last in the previous two weeks, so fast. And they said, you can't really wait. You can't really operate, he's too old. He's almost 18. You can't really wait. You're gonna have to take care of it um, by having him put down. And so fortunately, all of us that live in the city, you know, all the family members who live in the city were able to be there. Um, our oldest lives some hours away and wasn't able to come. But he was on FaceTime for a little while to be able to say goodbye, and we we just all cried our heads off for the rest of the day. It was really rough. But it, it was much better that we were able to be there for him than if we hadn't been. So, but I appreciate everyone's thoughts and condolences. That is that is much appreciated. I feel like I can talk about it now. A little easier. I couldn't at the time when it was going on, so. Oh, 
Domingo, welcome back. Nice to hear you're starting some new things going on. Sounds like some cool adventures. Things are going pretty well. I know I'm switching topics really fast. Yeah, I'm about... So that was the hard thing in our family. We, he was a family member, is a family member still. And we were hoping he could get to his 18th birthday, but it just wasn't in the cards. But we're just glad he didn't have to suffer more. All right, I need to make another label, don't I? I need to make another label. Oh, my brain is everywhere. I'm sorry. But one thing that I've decided, it is rough. It is really rough when you have to do that. But um, it is just all the joy that pets bring us. It's worth it. We might have to deal with that more often with pets than we would with people, you know, when, when we lose them because people have such a longer lifespan compared to many pets. But... Uh, oh, wrong label. But it is, it's worth it because they bring so much joy. That's that's kind of how I feel about it. I know some people, I don't judge anybody who feels differently because I know some people who, you know, they have a pet and they say, that was amazing, but I can't handle that again, and I totally respect that too. But that has been my decision. That they're worth it, and so I'm going to do it again kind of thing. Oh, okay. I really appreciate everybody. I, I think I might start crying now if I'm not careful. But what I would like to do is move over to the Beatles now because we had some requests for that. If I can get everybody over there, let's move to the Beatles. Let's see what we can see. Sorry about the shakiness. Um, I'm going to take out some of the excess plants. Ooh, ooh, cool. Oh, got to show you this. Giant water scavenger beetle right there. Out for a, on the haul out. Hanging out. So fun to see it out there. I love these guys. Look how big he is. I don't know if you can tell how big he is. Should I try to put my hand in there? I might scare him. But... Look how big he is. Actually, he looks even bigger um, in real life. He's, he's bigger. I'm going to see if I can, can tell how big he is. He's really chill right now. This one was uh, sent to me by uh, Bugs in Cyberspace. Bugs in Cyberspace. Um, I have some video footage of the unboxing. Um, this is my second one. The first one that they sent... Uh, passed away pretty quickly, you know, you, you can't tell with stuff like this what's going to happen and how long they've been alive. Not their fault, obviously. Not Bugs in Cyberspace fault. It just it passed. And then, so, next time I um, made a request, I made a request for another one. They sent me one, and this one's been doing well for a long time now. I don't remember exactly when it was shipped, but it's been a good long time. Sorry about the wiggles. I'm scooping out some of these, these excess plants, water lettuce and... and uh, duckweed. The, the beetle actually eats them, which is great. It keeps them under control to some extent. But sometimes I need to thin them manually. Um, if, if I did not have this beetle in here, this would be a solid wall of duckweed, basically, and maybe a little water lettuce left over. I wonder if I, I can just, if it'll let me pick it up. Uh, I don't want to frustrate it too much. Ooh, it dove into the water. Sorry okay we can get in there and we can look at stuff it'll be awesome and I'm just scooping out some excess plants so that we can get more light in the tank and we'll check things out okay I'm gonna try not to knock everything over which is I've already failed at that I'm knocking a bunch of stuff over I'm gonna try to put some food in 
the tank so we can watch it. Sorry about all the jiggling. I'll settle down in a second. So, yeah, somebody asked about what kind of snails. Most of the snails in here are ram's horns, and they're, they're like color morphs of ram's horns, just like a gem mix, if you will, of ram's horns. I'm not sure what they call it when you just get a whole bunch of different types all together. That's what I got. Some are pink, and some are blue, and some are red, and whatever else. Um, all right, so now that I'm putting some food down here, we're going to start seeing the beetles come. I'm already seeing some. Here's a banded, banded diving beetle, the Charlie Brown beetles, right here. There's a couple of uh, sunbursts coming along. They're just, they get active as soon as they smell the food and they start coming for it, which is fun. Aaron, thank you. I, I love Anubius. Um, this Anubius, at least some of it, not all of it, but some of it is descended from Anubius I got when I lived in Hawaii, like, I got it in 2004. <laughs> and I still have descendants of that Anubius. But not all of this. Some of it comes from, like, this one with the longer, thinner leaves is not from that stock. Um, that one back there, I'm not sure about that one, but, like, this one right here is from that original stock I got way back then. A lot of it is. So, a pine, the, most of the the beetles seem to leave each other alone. I, I don't know how it would be if I didn't give them any food for two weeks or something. But in general, they seem to leave each other alone. So, there, here comes the, the banded diving beetle. Um, so, Rainy... I don't have a Discord, but you can uh, send me links or photos or whatever on Instagram. I'm at Aquarimax Pets or a Facebook Messenger Aquarimax Pets. Oh, there. Banded Diving Beetle just grabbed it. So, somebody just asked about beetles. I don't actually ship out of the country currently. Um, so, I don't. It seems like some people are getting the Blue Death Fanny Beetles out there, and I'm not sure if it's occurring legally or illegally. Um, over there, but I personally don't ship to Germany. It's usually a little more bubbly in here. I turned the filter off for a little while just so that you can hear because it's too loud and the filter is running. Let's see, there, Emily is in the chat now. I see beetles roaming around the tank. I'm surprised they haven't found the food. I wonder if it's because the filter is off. I'm not going to turn it on though because the water current might actually help them find the food. I'm not sure. That would be interesting to find out if that were the case. But they are not... Uh, the filter is way too loud when I'm recording, so I'm not going to do that. But, let's see. But we can see up at the top. We need to clean the glass a little bit. It's a little bit... Uh, got a little bit of calcium carbonate growing on there. Or not growing on there, but you know what I mean. There's a sunburst diver. Let's see. I'm just trying to look around and see if there's some that you can see. There's one. There's a sunburst diver that's grabbed a fish food pellet from the surface and is munching it down. And there is a bandit. I don't know if it's... Um, oh, Emily, uh, let, me, let me figure out about shipping... Um, so you're in Washington. We'll have to figure out if I'm able to ship some of these. One problem is that this stuff, the duck weedle ship, it's practically bulletproof. But the water lettuce, the dwarf water lettuce, the larger stuff, is actually challenging to ship. It's not impossible, but it's challenging to do it successfully. I've done it, though, so we can look into that. So, Domingo, could ice buds succumb to the cold? Like if they were shipped? Or is that what you mean? Okay, thank you, Rainy. I'll, I'll give that a look. Thank you for sending that. Odin. Oh, glad to, to know that the uh, channel has been helpful for you. I've never kept giant African land snails. I'm assuming you're in Europe, where they can be legally kept, but... Uh, 
I'm glad I've been of help. I mean, isopods are pretty easy to keep with giant African land snails from what I've heard. They, they make good tank mates from what I heard, but it's, it's all, you know, second hand. I've never actually done that. Okay, send me a message, Emily. We'll see if we can figure it out. Oh, there's one of the, the gold diving beetles. They're really pretty, almost coppery. It's looking for a piece of food, and it's not, it's not succeeding. It looks like it's trying to wrestle a piece away from that snail. I think that's what it's doing. Let's see who wins. Well, there's a, there's a sunburst. Those are one of my favorites, seriously. Yeah, most most of the non-tropical isopods are pretty cold resistant. Some of them can stand temperatures under freezing for a little while, um, but most of them are, are fairly resistant to the cold. So, if you know, it depends on how cold. If it's just right around freezing and they're well insulated and especially if you have a heat pack it's not a huge deal oh yeah i love the golden apple snails um the ones that pomacia bridges i my my daughter had one that got really big for a while all right thank you sam for the super chat happy to answer the question and hopefully the Pods will do fine with the mosquito bits. One thing uh, you can do is just make sure that the mosquito bits, uh, you don't get any water infused with mosquito bits directly on the isopods. Avoid doing that. And then hopefully they will be okay. But it's a good thing to roll it out slowly, not put it on all your tanks at once. Oh yes, I do love the Anubias. They're so, so slow growing, but so beautiful. And they're just something, I don't know, calming about looking at them. I, I really get a kick out of it. I had some Java fern in here, which I love to lace Java fern. I used to produce so much lace Java fern, so much Java fern of different types, needle leaf, lace and whatnot, that I would ship it out. And uh, I've kind of shifted focus now. I. That used to be the main thing I would ship, honestly, back in the day, was uh, aquatic plants, because when I lived in Hawaii, that's about the only thing I could ship. I had to bring the plants personally to an APHIS inspection station, and they would inspect the plants before shipping them out of the airport uh, from Hawaii. And that's what I did, because that's one of the few things I could ship. Oh, Ramingo, I see what you mean. Like, which bug might you be able to find? Uh, if it's still snowing, your your uh, options will be limited. But there are some isopods that have been seen out uh, when there's snow on the ground. I think Porcelio spinicornis sometimes seen like that. So you might want to take a look and see if you can find any Porcelio spinicornis. Oh, Emily, which kind of Java ferns do you have? Uh, you know what, we're not getting a ton of activity here, are we? Should we take a look at the uh, desert tank to see what's going on there? I think that would be fun. Let's do that. Because, why not? Oh, there's the diabolical ironclad beetle right there. Doing his thing. I'm going to pull the, uh, pull the plug so that I can... Focus more on what's going on here. I see various beetles kicking around. Interestingly, I do not see any of the uh, velvet ants at the moment, even though they've been pretty active lately. They're not active right now. What's up with that? I got to see a, a tortoise beetle in the wild in Arizona this past uh, summer with Sky Island Adventures. It was really cool. I think I saw a couple of them. There's another little beetle. 
some kind of tenebrionid. I'm not sure what species this is. But it's it's a small one. It's, if you can tell in comparison to the to the dial. We have a rough death painting beetle over here. There's a blue death painting beetle over there in the corner. So Mystic Drake, fungus gnats per se, you know, they're not necessarily a horrible thing. They're not going crazy in the bins. They are a nuisance to a lot of people, but they're not really that problematic. If you don't mind them, you know, being everywhere and flying up your nose and stuff, then they're not going to cause a, a huge problem for your isopods. They're not like, going to parasitize the isopods. It's possible if they were a huge infestation, you might have other problems. But in general, they don't seem to hurt the pods, but they will try to fly up into your face. I think they're attracted by the carbon dioxide in your face, that your, your face is emanating when you breathe. I think that's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I see that 503 is talking about the same thing. This is um, Eliotis obscurus here, the biggest beetle in the tank. It's not as big as my uh, water scavenger beetle, but it's pretty big. So the blue death fanny beetles really do better when it's not too humid. If it is too humid, that could be a problem for them. That is true. Sounds like some people have brought that up. So my blue death fanny beetles are not particularly picky if they're hungry. They will eat fish food, they will eat fruit, they'll eat beetle jelly. It's good to give them a lot of protein. They really love crickets. Uh, a lot of protein in the form of insect protein is like a, a good staple for them. They'll eat that. They'll also eat other things like carrots and stuff. Oh yeah, and I do have a sundew plant and it is going wild on the fungus gnats. It goes wild. It's constantly covered in fungus gnats. It's growing like crazy. Threw out a big flower spike. Most of the flowers on it, if not all of them, have bloomed now. So I'm hoping to get some seeds and plant, plant some more, get some more going. I think that'd be fun. I love the, the sundew. It's a Drosera capensis, the cape sundew. And it is doing fantastically as far as eating fungus gnats. And I do have a heat lamp too, Ramingo. This is a heat lamp. It's a halogen lamp, the Zoomed, I think, a 50 watt, and I just have it aimed down at this spot, and the beetles will come and warm themselves, they'll bask in it. Uh, the blue death fainting beetles a lot of times will sit around the edge of the heat and find the temperature where they're comfortable, and they seem to like it. Theropod hunter. Have you seen death fanning beetles that are taller and more round than the blues, but they're a grayish ochre color? I don't think so. That sounds interesting. I've seen the blister beetles that are more round. Do they look like round sort of grayish cantaloupes to me? <laughs> That's what I think of. I've seen those. Oh, we've got a super chat from Emily. Fantastic. Do you still have endlers you are offering for new homes? Have you ever bred caridina shrimp or neocaridina shrimp before? Do you have any shrimp now? I have bred Neocaridina shrimp. I do have endlers available, lots of them, Blue Star um, Campoma endlers. And I have bred Neocaridina of various colors. Uh, I have not bred Caridina shrimp, though. But that is the fifth super chat on the live stream. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. That's awesome. But yeah, uh, message me and we can, we can talk about... Uh, Endlers. So I don't have any isopods in the desert community. I once found a Venezilo Arizonicus in uh, my desert enclosure, and I, I'm assuming it came along with beetles or something, substrate, whatever. And everybody, they've knocked down the... I can't do it. I can't fix it right now. They've knocked down their, uh, their nectar feeders. 
but I can't fix it with just one hand, so we'll just kind of focus in on the beetles here doing their thing and not worry about it too long, but I can fix it after. It's only five more minutes. So, but yeah, I don't keep any isopods in here on purpose. Other, that Venezuela Arizona case was 